Well, good morning to you again. I am uh, excited to be in the middle of this series on real life, how to get through what you're going through. And uh, I, I like how we've covered a lot of topics. We've talked about mental health. Uh, we talked about crisis last week. Today we're talking about cynicism. But one of the things that nobody ever prepared me for, nobody got me ready for, was the experiences that I had as a kid. And perhaps you've had some of them as well, maybe even as an adult, where your parents would take you on an errand. And it was like a series of errands, right? So you would go to one store, and then you would go to another. You'd go to the grocery store, the hardware store, and then like you're almost done. It's Saturday. You're ready to go home and like do whatever it is that you're going to do. And you're almost there. And then as you guys are walking out of the store, your parent runs into somebody that they know. And you're like, oh my gosh. And they talk. And they talk. And they continue to talk. And odds are it was a church member that they're going to see tomorrow. And they just keep talking. And you think, I'm going to die here in the Target parking lot. I'm going to age to the point that I'm like 70, 80, 90 years old. And this is going to be where they bury me, here in space 54 in the Target shopping center. And that is cynicism. This hopelessness. This lostness. This feeling of like, oh, it's just never going to end. I had this happen to me as an adult, actually. We were at uh, a children's performance for my kids at their school, and Kim was talking to somebody that she knows. And I was like, honey, I'm like wrangling the children. They're just talking. I'm like, baby, we, we got to go. I was like, I'm leaving. I'm taking these children with me. You may find your own way home, but I'm going home. She came with us. Just point of advice, don't leave your spouse anywhere. It's not nice. Cynicism. Cynicism. You just eventually get convinced that nothing is going to change. Nothing is going to affect it. No, no possibility. You can't do enough. You can't say enough. You can't pray enough. It's not going to change. And in our culture, unfortunately, we pride ourselves on our cynicism. We pride ourselves on our ability to look beyond, or what we think is our ability, look beyond somebody's motives, their intentions, and be like, oh, well, I, I don't believe that. I, you have to earn my trust. I don't take anything on face value. Everybody's always working an angle. Everybody lies. We live in a culture that loves to be cynical and worships it. And while it's good not to be uh, completely naive, I think Jesus even teaches some about that. It's important for us to realize that there are dangers in becoming cynical. And Psalm 13 outlines this a little bit for us. So that's where we're going to be today. We're going to be in Psalm 13. And I want us to look at the cause of cynicism. What actually is it that makes us cynical, that feeds the cynicism in our life? And then what is the danger? What's the crisis that comes from being cynical? Why is it such a risk? And then how do we fix it? What's the cure? So let's start in the first two verses of Psalm 13. What is the cause of cynicism? This is to the choir master, a Psalm of David, and he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? It's a short little Psalm, six verses, but David packs a lot of punch in this short Psalm. A Lutheran scholar, who uh, his name is Rolf Jacobson, which is that's the most Lutheran scholar name I've ever heard in my life, and he works at an aptly named seminary, Luther Seminary. And his commentary on the Psalms talks about how there's three sort of complaints going on here in these first two verses. The first one's theological: How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? This complaint is with God. God, why are you not responding? Why are you not acting? This idea of forgetting isn't that God was sending about, out a bunch of invitations and left David's name off the list. That's not what he's talking about. Forgetting and remembering in the Bible is, is this thing where you act in accordance with the person's interests. So when we remember God, we respond to his love and we obey him. That's what it means to remember God, to remember his commandments. To forget God is to act as if God doesn't matter, if God doesn't exist. 
Forget about him. I don't have to do anything he tells me to do. So when God forgets or remembers somebody, it has to do with blessing and protection, comfort, relationship, him responding when we pray. And so apparently in David's life, David's been speaking, he's been going to God, and God's not responding. And so David's starting to get a little cynical about it. The second complaint is a personal one. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? Now that David doesn't have God to rely on because God's gone silent, David's having to rely on himself. And I assume this is written after he becomes king. And so David's looking at himself. He's like, I can't meet these challenges. I'm not educated in the ways of being a king. I was a shepherd boy. And from there, I was running around in the, in the wilderness for, for years. Basically a warlord. I'm not ready for this. I'm not equipped for this. I don't trust my decision-making process. I'm an imposter. Without you, God, I can't do this. And then his third complaint is a social one. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? David looks at the situation at hand and he's like, this is out of control. There are people who don't have my good intentions at heart. There are people that don't have my kingdom's good intentions at heart. This is not good. God, how long are you going to let this go on? What are you going to do? But all of this is not the root of cynicism. It's part of it, but it's not the root. It's not the cause of cynicism in his life. You see, cynicism is defined as this. It is doubting the motives, the sincerity, and the goodness of others. It is often accompanied by mistrust, scorn, and pessimism about others and humanity as a whole. And you can see how this infects our relationship with other people, with God. You start to doubt his good intentions. Not that he doesn't know what he's doing. You think he knows exactly what he's doing. But his intentions are poor. He doesn't really love us. He says this, he says that, but he's not really that way. I was listening to this week, uh, ironically, I guess, uh, a sermon by Tim Keller, who passed away on Friday at the age of 72 from pancreatic cancer. And uh, in the sermon, it was, it was on Genesis 15, and we'll talk more about this uh, later, but he, he, he points this out. He says essentially that cynicism is believing in God, but not believing God. So you believe in him. He's there. He exists. I don't trust him at what he says. I think there's something, there's an ulterior motive to God. But again, it's not a crisis that makes us cynical. We face crises all the time. I had a crisis earlier today. It was a small one, but it's resolved and I moved on. No, crisis is not what happens. The, the presence of, and it happens four times in this, in this passage. David introduces a concept four times in two verses. And this is where cynicism comes from. He says, how long, O Lord, how long, how long, how long? You see, David introduces the concept of time to his crisis. And this is what makes us cynical. Time. And those aren't the only time words in the passage. David says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long and ha must I have sorrow in my heart all the day? You see, unresolved crisis plus time, so over time, leads to cynicism. If you have a crisis in your life that doesn't get resolved for longer and longer, and you pray about it, and you talk to God about it, and you talk to other people about it, and you exhaust every single idea that you have to try and fix it, and it's still not fixed, you become cynical. It's never going to change. That person's never going to change. They're always going to be like that. They're always going to be like that. It doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter what God does. They're always going to be that person. Or it doesn't matter what we do, what laws we pass. We're always going to have to deal with the violence in people's hearts. It's always going to be like this. It's never going to change. Our struggles, our afflictions, our difficulties, all these wind up being like wind or water going against rocks, and it just wears us down. It wears our faith down. It wears our faith in other people down, our faith in God down. And we're left with these fragile embers rather than a roaring flame of faith. We're left with this small candle that's just blown about by the wind and is incredibly fragile. 
When God says something or does something in somebody's life, we wait for the other shoe to drop. We're like, yeah, well, he helped out here, but look at all this other stuff and not do anything about. Or when we're spending time with the Lord in prayer and we actually meet with God, we feel his presence. We're like, that's awesome. It's probably not going to be like that tomorrow. And so we start doubting God, but then we also start doubting ourselves. We think, oh, well, maybe the reason why God's not showing up or maybe the reason why things aren't happening in my life is because of me. I'm the problem. I'm the mistake. I'm the biggest enemy in my life. My sin, my brokenness. And so God doesn't want anything to do with me. And then we look around and we look at the world that we're in and we start doubting other people. We see the violence, the shootings, war, famine, disease. We think, God, are you going to do anything about this? And so you see the complaints Again, same ones that David has. Theological, personal, social. But cynicism, and this is important for us to see, cynicism is not faithlessness in the classical sense. It's not atheism. An atheist doesn't, atheist doesn't care wh- whether or not a good God does anything because they don't believe in God. An atheist may ask the question, how can a good God allow this to happen? But it's a purely uh, uh, academic exercise for them. For a cynic, it's personal. A cynic still believes in God. They just don't believe God. They start wondering if God is everything he's cracked up to be. Or they try to operate in a way that kind of minimizes God's deficiencies in their mind. They, They try to cover up for him a little bit to save their faith. Anne Rice, who's a famous author, was a famous author, most famous for the book and then the subsequent movie Interview with a Vampire. She wrote a lot of vampire books, um, but she was also, she grew up Catholic. Uh, She rejected her Catholicism and then became an atheist. And at some point she wrote two books about Jesus. I'm not sure how you get there from writing books about vampires. She did. And it wound up leading her to becoming a committed believer. But in 2012, she wrote this. She said, today I quit being a Christian. I remain committed to Christ as always, but not to being Christian or to being part of Christianity. It is simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. For 10 years I've tried, I've failed. I'm an outsider, my conscience will allow nothing else. Now, what happened to Anne Rice was that she had uh, very progressive views on sexuality and abortion, and she felt as though the church was wrongly condemning people. And so it says here in, in, in her quote that she tried to reconcile that. She couldn't, and so it seems like she left the organized church. This is classic Christian cynicism. All the elements are there. She's still committed to Christ. She even says, as always, which is not true, as always. We know that her conversion happened in the middle of her life. But notice all the time elements in there. For 10 years, I've tried, I've failed. I no longer can keep up with this. Time wore her down. Then she lost her faith in other people. Notice what she calls the church. Quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, which is a word that only an author would use, and infamous group. And she loses faith in herself. She says, I've tried, I've failed. She becomes cynical about her own ability, about the others. She goes to God and says, how long am I going to have to put up with the church? And finally, she stops. It's an unresolved crisis over time, and it wears her down. Many of you, like we talked about last week, are in the midst of an unresolved crisis. And it's one that's been going on over time. Some of you are in chronic pain. Pain is not the problem. It's the chronic nature of it. Many of us can put up with pain. If I have a a pain that that happens for a day, that's not so bad. But for some of you, you've been dealing with pain for years. It's negatively impacting your life. You have chronic pain. You begin to become cynical about whether God cares about your hurt. Maybe you're walking through infertility. Like we talked about last week, maybe you're a single adult. And that is a pain, that's a burden that you don't want to carry. You want to be married. Maybe it's on the corporate level. 
Maybe you look around at the world and you're like, what is happening? Maybe you're lonely. Maybe you're purposeless. And you've become cynical. Does God really even care? And you might not say it in exactly those words because you're a good Baptist and you wouldn't approach things that way. But you live like it. You pray like it. So what's the problem there? Why is it so dangerous to be cynical? Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the crisis that comes from cynicism. Verse 3, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. David's psalm may be a lament, but it doesn't stay lamenting, which is okay if it does. But David recognizes something. It's important to move on. And not just move on, but move on with God. He can't stay here. He has to move forward with the Lord. And so he says three things. Again, this is Jacobson speaking. Jacobson gave us three things that David says that he's asking of God. The first one is consider. He basically goes to God and says, very much like Job, says, God, do you see what's happening here? Open your eyes, God. Don't you understand what's taking place? And he doesn't stop it. Consider, he says, and answer me, O God. That's, God, do you see what's happening? Now do something about it. Do something. But then he does something really interesting. He says, light up my eyes. That's really interesting. Light up my eyes. This is enlightenment. Not in the way we think of enlightenment. It's not an Eastern kind of thing. It's not a, a, a rational thing. He's asking for revelation. He's asking for God to show him the circumstances from God's perspective. God, I see this situation from my perspective. I think you should do something about it other than what you're probably already doing, but I could be wrong. This is what Job misses at first, and Job gets a healthy dose of in the last couple chapters of the book. Because Job, at the end of his conversation with God, says, I spoke wrongly. I didn't know what I was talking about. And David is already preemptively being like, it's possible that I don't know what I'm talking about here. Open my eyes, God. Help me to see what's going on. Because David recognizes something about the growing cynicism in his life. His perspective is growing dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And this is the danger of cynicism. The danger of cynicism is your life growing dimmer and dimmer. Your hope, your joy, your expectation that something will change peters out. For high school seniors who are graduating and heading into high or heading into college, that grayness that comes in that comes from living a life on your own and you kind of start slacking off in your devotions to the Lord. That doesn't happen all of a sudden. It's a grayness that seeps into your life. It's a cynicism that crops up. Your faith goes from, and this happens to all of us, your faith goes from this roaring fire, this bonfire that you had when you were young or when you first became a believer to this fragile little flame Now, when you have a roaring bonfire and wind comes, what happens to the bonfire? It spreads, right? Yeah. Crisis actually causes the flames of our faith to spread. It goes to other people. It becomes infectious. If you have a roaring fire of faith, crisis just fuels it. But if your faith is weak, what does wind do to a a flame on a candle? Blows it out. That's why we, when you have a candle, and again, I don't know why I have this motion. I have like the 1700s candle holder. You carry it like this. You're carrying it like that, and you're, you're trying to protect it from the breeze. The slightest breeze will blow it out. I think this is why David says to light up his eyes. Your faith is supposed to be this light by which you see everything else around you. That's why it needs to be this bonfire. And it's the light by which other people see the world. But your cynicism, it sucks the color out. It sucks the light out. And so your world becomes gray and it makes things gray for other people as well. And the way this looks, it's very easy to see how this looks. 
Whenever you see something happening in somebody's life, you immediately begin to question it. So somebody gives money to the church. You think, oh, they only did that for the tax break. Or you hear us. You heard Brandon just now talk about generosity and talk about giving to the church. And the cynic will say, oh, well, they just want to do that so they can get a raise. They've got enough money. Or you, you hear about somebody doing something kind. Maybe you see somebody in worship raising their hands or singing with their eyes closed. And you think, oh, they're only doing that because people are watching them. Or somebody changes. Finally. God does something in somebody's life. They change. They come to you. They offer an apology. And your response is, well, we'll see how long that lasts. This those are the gray responses of a cynic. The danger of cynicism is it chokes out the light from your eyes. It chokes out the light from how you see the world. Light is a key metaphor for God. God is light. In him there is no darkness. The cynic, though, doesn't walk in darkness. The cynic walks in a twilight shadow world where the light of God filters in through very gray clouds. And so, yes, you can see, but only as much as to protect yourself to play the game so you still show up to church you still maybe even read your bible you maybe still pray but you are not hopeful and you are not expectant and then it gets worse we start bragging about it as we said earlier we don't trust people easily i see through people i know people i know how people are and all of this grayness impacts our relationship with god as well spiritual cynicism is approaching God without hope, without expectation, that he will ever set to rights the things we've asked for. Notice what David says in verses three and four. He talks about sleeping the sleep of death, enemy prevailing over him, foes rejoicing over him. He's worried that he's gonna fall into cynicism. He's like, this is gonna wind up exactly the way that I think it will. I'm so afraid that I'm going to fail. I'm so afraid that God is going to abandon me. And this is going to turn out just like I think it will. And so we do things. We have cynicism to protect our faith. Rather than our faith enlightening us and protecting us, we try to protect it. So more than anything, we pray without expectation. We pray as a people without hope. We pray without expecting anything to happen. I had somebody stop me after the service uh, last hour and ask, when you say pray with expectation, do you mean like praying that God will, when, when we ask God for things, he's going to work for us? And I want to be very clear about something. I don't think God works for us. I think God works. So when I say pray with expectation, you are praying that God will do something. We pray that God will act, that he will move, and in our limited understanding of what God might do, absolutely you can offer up, God, please heal this person. God, please change this person's heart. God, please provide for me. And you can expect that God will do things. I'm praying, and I'm praying with expectation. I'm praying with hope. But I'm also expecting that God maybe have a, has a different plan than I'm aware of, and that's why you fall back on but God, it's possible that I'm wrong. Please enlighten me. Lighten my eyes so that I can see your plan and I can expect the right things. But so many of us don't want to go through those steps. So we pray and we're like, heal this person. And we move on. We pray without any expectation, without any imagination. That's why we fall back on the God provide. Amen. Rather than, than, than saying, like, when we, when we bless our food, and I'm guilty of this, I have a, a thing against long prayers when food's on the table. If you want to pray long, do it before the food gets there. This is hot. I smell it. But when we get our food, why do we thank God, God, thank you for this food? Why don't we walk through, God, thank you for these beans that some farmer somewhere grew and may you bless those hands and thank you and bless his crops. And God, thank you for these potatoes that probably came from Idaho God, please bless the people of Idaho. Like, thank you for this steak, for the cow that gave its life so that we might have this deliciousness. Again, it's humorous. And please don't pray that long when everybody's sitting there waiting on you. 
But at the same time, why do we not pray with more expectation and imagination? Is it not because we're cynical? I think that it is. So how do we address this? How do we address this? What's the cure for cynicism? David, fortunately, ends miles away from where he started. And in verse 5, he says, But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully with me. There are three things. There's lots of triads in this sermon. I apologize. But there are three things that we can do to find a cure for cynicism. And the first one is the most important David says, I trusted in your steadfast love. The first is, we must trust. David says, I trusted in your steadfast love. Steadfast love in uh, Hebrew is one word. And I say it before, we've talked about it a lot. It's the word hesed. Hesed. And this is a technical term for God's covenantal love. So when David says, I trust in your steadfast love, he's not saying, God, I trust you because you have warm, squishy feelings for me. He's not saying, I trust you because I'm so great and I'm so lovable. What he's saying is, God, I trust you because you have agreed to love us. I did a wedding yesterday. And a wedding, you make a covenantal agreement that I'm going to love this person whether I feel like loving them or not. Whether they're lovable or not, I agree I am making a covenant to love this person. And this is what God has done. God has made a covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, and all their descendants that I will love you. I will remember you. And it's a covenant that's made in blood. The sermon that I was talking about earlier that Tim Keller preached, you can find it on a podcast now. It's excellent. It's on Genesis 15, which he says, and I might agree with him, is the most important chapter in all of the Bible. It's the chapter where God makes a covenant with Abraham. So Abraham tells, uh, or God tells Abraham, I'm going to give you land, and I'm going to give you descendants. And Abraham says, that's great, God. When are you going to do that? Because I'm in my 90s. My wife is also in her 90s. Basically, Abraham says, how long, O Lord? And God says, this is how you're going to know that I'm going to do this. Go get some animals. And what's interesting, and Keller points this out, he says that, that Abraham immediately knows what to do with the animals. He cuts most of them in half, lays them on the sides, and they create an aisle. And then Abraham falls asleep. And when Abraham falls asleep, there's this dark cloud that comes and almost pushes him to the ground. And he sees this smoking pot and this torch pass through the carcasses. There's no commentary on why this happens. But we know through some other historical research what's going on. This is how you signed an agreement back then. They didn't put a signature on anything. You made this, this aisle of, of flesh, essentially. And either the servant or the, the king and a servant or a lord and a vassal would pass through, would go down the middle aisle. And basically what you're saying is, if I don't hold up my end of the agreement, may what happened to these animals happen to me. May I be chopped up? May I be forgotten? May I be food for the birds? You thought our contracts were bad. Man. And what's really powerful about this is guess who goes through and makes the agreement? It's God. God is the one who passes through. And so God says, may I be cut off? May I be destroyed? May I not be what you think I am if I fail to hold my end of the agreement up? But what's interesting is he also does that on behalf of Abraham. And he says, Abraham, if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, I'm still going to take care of this for you. This is an unconditional covenant made with Abraham. And Abraham says, I'm good. I believe you. Abraham, and it's, this is the passage that says it is, Abraham believed God. Not believed in God, believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham's not a cynic. And then thousands of years later, the Lord returns. Not as a smoking pot and a torch, but in the flesh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And he lives with us, he dwells among us, and then one day, because of our sin, because of our failure, because of our inability to uphold the end of the covenant, he's crucified. While he is not chopped to pieces, he is pierced. If he had been left out there, his, food, his flesh would have been food for the birds. 
and he's crucified. He passes between two carcasses, two other men being killed. And deep darkness descends on the earth. And he's asking you when he does that, he's telling you that your sins, your brokenness, all the things that that we're cynical about, he forgives us and he's going to make a new world. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth if you'll just believe him, if you'll just trust him. When he says he loves you, that he does. When he has good things for you, he does. And today you have the opportunity, if you never have, to believe God and let it be credited to you as righteousness, as right standing before God. Will you do it? And for those of us who are believers but have found ourselves wandering in cynicism, we find the same opportunity to go back to the foot of that cross and to trust God again, anew, refreshing our fragile faith, pouring gasoline on a flame that maybe started to go out. Will you believe God? Whatever it is, whatever crisis has been going on in your life, whatever chronic issue you have, whatever thing that makes you cry out, how long? Will you believe him? Will you trust him? And when you do that, will you give him thanksgiving? Will you give him rejoicing? That's the last two things that David talks about. He rejoices in salvation because God has dealt bountifully with him. Will you be grateful and rejoice? That's out of our trust in God is where our gratitude and our rejoicing has to come from. Are we grateful? I think we often forget to be. But if we are trusting him, we will be. I'll close with this. Anne Rice, when she converted, before the cynicism set in, had this to say about her faith, and I think it's beautiful. In the moment of surrender, I let go of all the theological or social questions which had kept me from God for countless years. I simply let them go. There was the sense, profound and wordless, that if he knew everything, I did not have to know everything, and that in seeking to know everything, I'd been, all of my life, missing the entire point. No social paradox, no historic disaster, no hideous record of injustice or misery should keep me from him. No question of scriptural integrity, no torment over the fate of this or that atheist or gay friend, no worry for those condemned and ostracized by my church or any other church should stand between me and him. The reason? It was magnificently simple. He knew how or why everything happened. He knew the disposition of every single soul. He wasn't going to let anything happen by accident. Nobody was going to go to hell by mistake. That is a faith without cynicism. Is that our faith? Or do we have a cynical faith? Do we have a faith that doubts, that tempers our expectations to protect ourselves? Do we pride ourselves in our cynicism? It's a dangerous thing. Don't let yourself stay there. Trust him. Don't just trust him at his word. Trust him at what he did for you on the cross. There's no ulterior motive there. He did it for his glory. Yes, he's open about that. But he did it for our good as well. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for how you have worked so mightily and so powerful in our lives. I would like to say, how can we do anything but trust you? But I know that when the first bad thing happens this week or when the first problem or challenge I run into happens this week, I know I'll begin to doubt. And cynicism may creep in again. Oh Lord, please protect us from that cynicism. Give us fresh faith in you. May it be a roaring fire. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.